Thurston County District Court is no longer holding jury trials, and some other hearings and court proceedings are being conducted over webcam. Here to talk more about these changes is District Court Judge Brett Buckley. Thanks for joining us, Judge Buckley. Um, so how has your daily routine changed? Are you working remotely from home? Good morning, Robert. Uh, good to see you again. And I'm guessing the answer is obvious. I typically uh, don't wear this under my robe. Uh, so yes, I am working at home. I will go into court later this afternoon. We run a jail calendar every day of the week and I will be running that calendar today at 1.30 with just a clerk in the courtroom and defendant on video and the lawyers calling in. But otherwise, I am at home. Frankly, my car very rarely leaves the garage. So the Board of County Commissioners has ordered a temporary closure of the courthouse except for essential court functions. What are these functions? Uh, everything we do is essential. Uh, but that being said, uh, we have, through a series of orders, significantly restricted those functions that we do engage in in an effort to uh, restrict the number of people we come into contact with and people that have to come into contact with us and people that have to come into contact with other people within the confines of the courthouse. We started back on the 16th of March with uh, an order in response to the growing pandemic. Uh, the Chief Justice of the Washington State Supreme Court, Deborah Stevens, uh, issued an order authorizing presiding judges to take whatever action they believe appropriate in their jurisdiction to uh, maintain the safety of the public in their access to the courts. And so on the 16th of March, we suspended all jury trials. It made no sense asking our citizens to come in and congregate and put themselves at risk in order to meet the needs of the court. So we suspended those and at the appropriate time we'll pick those back up. Uh, we also suspended all traffic hearings, which doesn't mean that you can't get a traffic ticket if you're not driving appropriately, but uh, right now the best way to respond if you do get a traffic ticket is to go online through the court's website and you can submit an email response and we will deal with it at that arm's length way electronically rather than in person. Uh, we also suspended all civil proceedings with one very significant exception, we do still deal with uh, protection orders, both uh, domestic violence protection orders and anti-harassment orders, and the petitions are available through the district court website, and you can prepare that petition and submit it, and it will be uh, seen by a judge uh, concerning any emergent orders. Uh, back two days later, and just this is sort of a reflection of the fast-moving pace of one, uh, this disease, and two, the information about this disease. So on the 18th of March, uh, we uh, then further restricted the activities that we're engaged in. And at that point, we said we're only going to do our in-custody or jail calendars, which we do by video because we use remote jails. The jail is no longer at the courthouse. Uh, state uh, defendants are held out at what's called the ARC the Accountability and Restitution Center uh, over by Motman uh, Industrial Area. And then the Lacey cases and Tumwater cases that we hear, uh, their defendants are held in the Nisqually Jail. Both of those are remote. They, the defendants appear by video from the jail. Typically, the defense counsel would be sitting with them in the jail in the video room. Uh, but given uh, the nature of this disease and the interests of the jails to try to keep outside people from coming in. The defendant's attorneys now call in, as does the prosecutor. So it's kind of an eerie situation where we're actually sitting in a courtroom so we can see these video feeds, but the only one in there is the judge and a clerk, and then everybody else is appearing either like, uh, by video or by phone. Uh, also on that day, we authorized our employees to bring their children to work uh, because the governor had uh, ordered uh, the closure of schools. And that of course creates all kinds of issues for folks who are attempting to maintain their employment uh, while having children at home. So we've allowed our uh, employees uh, when they were coming into work to bring their children with them. And then on the uh, 20th of March, we further restricted what we were doing and uh, said we would have no further in-person hearings 
and uh, we basically locked the door to the courthouse. So it would be very few people there. We sent most of our staff home to work from home. So we helped address that children at home issue that way. Uh, and without public coming there, we didn't need court security there. Uh, and we didn't need our folks dealing uh, at the public counter who uh, would answer questions and the, those sorts of things in the context of their jobs. Uh, so uh, they've all gone home and right now it's just a judge and a clerk who were there when we're running these calendars and it's eerily quiet, but somehow it seems fairly safe. So uh, right now I think we're doing a good thing. And just as an aside, I think, you know, watching the news and listening to the news and reading the news, I think the fact that this state has acted so quickly in responding to uh, the parameters of this disease and institutionally the judicial system and just statewide, the, go the governor and the rest of the government, and then all the citizens in this state responding to the various recommendations, I think have been extraordinarily helpful. And one of the reasons why we actually, even though we were the initial hotbed for this disease, are seeing really positive results in limiting uh, the spread of that disease. So uh, as extreme as the measures we have taken uh, and the change that that puts on our system and different ways of dealing uh, with our caseload, it has, I think, been effective to take this approach. So, so these video conferencing and doing hearings over video or, or telephone, is that working well? And, and do you think you might implement some of those changes permanently, uh, you know, for people that are, have a harder time to get to the courts? Uh, that's a great question. And I think a lot of what we're doing now is going to lead to change. And it, in fact, it may just hasten change that was coming our direction anyway. Uh, but let me just take one step back and say the in custody calendars that we are now doing by video, uh, we have been doing for 10 years or more. Uh, and it was a way to keep uh, corrections officers from having to shuttle folks from jail into the courtroom and commingle with the public and then back to jail. Uh, so we had recognized that need a long time ago and have been running video calendars. So we did have some experience and this was a fairly seamless uh, approach for us. All we've done is uh, have the lawyers now appear remotely rather than have a prosecutor in the courtroom and a defense counsel in the jail, you know, just reducing the exposures for everybody involved. Now, we have not yet run any other video hearings. In fact, this coming Monday, we are going to start running out of custody disposition hearings. That is, people are going to plead guilty to their charges, or they're going to do a deferred prosecution potentially on their charge, or some other action on their charge, which will end the current state of their charge. And we're going to do that through this very same mechanism that we're using here. Our platform probably will be Zoom, and uh, we will conduct hearings on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with the defendant appearing by computer access, uh, their attorney in a different location, also uh, through the same way, and then the prosecutor the very same way, and uh, the judge uh, and the clerk uh, appearing the same way. Now, one of the things that we cannot get away from in the judicial system is having a record of our proceedings. So that's somewhat stymied our ability to conduct proceedings to this point. So we've been attempting to address it. And this mechanism, Zoom, allows us to uh, be able to record in the court. So in the courtroom will be the judge and the clerk, and we can record the proceedings through our recording system in the courtroom and thus have a record of what has transpired. Now, there is one other significant uh, hurdle to what uh, conducting these uh, hearings in a different manner than we have traditionally done. And that is that court proceedings are supposed to be public. It's a constitutional requirement. It makes great sense. We don't want judges making decisions in secret. Uh, and in order to uh, address that, we have been trying to uh, figure out how we would conduct these proceedings. And I believe we are now 
looking at sometime next week, hoping to start streaming these proceedings on YouTube. So create a YouTube channel, which would allow members of the public uh, who were interested to uh, log in and watch the court proceedings. They would not participate on the Zoom platform, but they could watch the Zoom platform uh, being displayed through YouTube. So uh, this technology has been a great assistance to us. Uh, now, I have also started two weeks ago just using the phone, a very simple technology, uh, to reach out to every participant in our mental health courts and veterans courts. We have 60 people in these courts, and they are among the most vulnerable of the defendants that we work with. And rather than just say, we aren't going to have, have your case heard on a regular calendar now, and who knows when we'll be back, we thought it important to start a process of reaching out to them and just talking and letting them know uh, we're here, we're aware they are at home, and we wanted to check up on them. And we uh, had phone conferences with each and every one of them over a period of about uh, seven or eight days. And we will continue that process as we go forward with the hope being that uh, our future contacts will be uh, via this platform so that we can actually have visual contact as well as the audio contact. But, you know, it was my impression that just that simple phone call when people are isolated at home and people for whom isolation sometimes tends to be a significant symptom of their disease, uh, it was really meaningful to just, you know, have those words exchanged and be able to uh, touch base and let them know we're still concerned about them and uh, focused on their efforts to try to uh, heal themselves. So we've, we've done that uh, uh, through the audio portion. And then we also conduct uh, staff meetings now regularly, uh, weekly staff meetings through the Zoom process. And so we have our 33 folks up here on, and right now it's just you and I on the uh, Zoom monitor, which makes it much easier for my eyes to track. But when we have 33 people on there and, you know, your people are chiming in, I, it's just, it's fantastic opportunity to make connection with people uh, when we're all doing what we should be doing, which is staying home. So we're staying home, staying healthy, uh, but we're also maintaining connection, which all of us know is really important at this time. Now, now you haven't gotten to the point where um, you're having juries participate over Zoom. Is that correct? That is correct. Is there plans and to do that? No, at this point, not. There's a lot of debate about the appropriateness of that. I, we're going to try to do as many hearings as we can uh, with Zoom and with this technology as long as we have these stay home orders. Uh, but when it comes time for members of the public to come in because juries assemble together and there's, it's not just the six or the 12 because we have to bring in 30 or 40 or 50 to mm -hmm. pick the jury. And so that means they're congregated. Yeah. Uh, and for example, the space we have in district court because of the very significant space restrictions this building provides us, uh, we only have one jury room and all of the people have to wait in that jury room prior to going into court. And that may have 20 seats in it, but they are immediately next to each other. And then when they assemble in court, they're sitting right next to each other. We don't have the room to spread people out. Uh, so that's been, that would be problematic. And then jurors are asked to uh, weigh the evidence before them to include the testimony of all the witnesses. And one of the things that jurors rely on a lot is just watching the demeanor of somebody. And the demeanor of somebody uh, through uh, a video medium is going to be a lot different uh, than it is in person, at least as our minds work. I don't know that we are fully capable of assessing demeanor yet through video as uh, we believe we are when we can see it in person. So right now, I don't expect juries uh, to be done through a video medium. Uh, now, is that possible in 10 years or 15 years? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we'd be foolish to think it will never happen because technology and life seems to be moving, so moving us in that direction. Right. Well, um, I know there's a concern of um, overpopulating the jails right now, especially when you're putting people you know, in close proximity to each other, and there's the risk that this will spread in the jails. Are the courts um, 
being lenient, offering, uh, you know, different forms of punishment like fees or community services? And are there any plans to release uh, some light offenders from jail? Short answer is yes, all of those. And to elaborate a little bit more, that's essentially what we've been doing with our jail calendars every single day. Every single day with the jail calendar, we've had requests uh, for release of uh, defendants from custody. And we have been granting those requests. And in fact, what we've told the attorneys is if both parties, that is the defense counsel and the prosecutor agree to release, we don't even have to have a hearing. They can just present what's called an ex party order, which means uh, just one party is sending the order to the judge and the judge will sign it if both parties agree that the defendant can be released. So we set up both those processes for addressing uh, the needs of trying to reduce the jail population. The fewer people that are in jail, the safer the folks who are in jail are and uh, the less likely that if somebody has a disease, it would spread to others. So we understand that and we are making attempts to do that. Now, we want to also make sure that we don't ignore public safety in doing so. So we've been trying to use other technologies in order to enhance uh, our monitoring of folks. We have uh, what's called electronic home monitoring, where if somebody's not in jail, a lot of them have been released to electronic home monitoring, which I suspect most people are familiar with it. You just wear an ankle monitor and it tells the monitoring agency where you are. And if you're supposed to stay at home, then you have to stay at home. And so we will know if you leave and then that's a problem. Uh, and then we also have ways of monitoring alcohol consumption through devices that you uh, wear on your ankle and it can measure the uh, perspiration of your skin to tell us whether you've absorbed any alcohol or not. And we use that aggressively. We also have technology that we can require that is put on your car so that you can't start your car if you have alcohol on your breath. So we've been aggressively using those technologies to try to take people out of custody without uh, having a significant impact on public safety with them not being locked up. Now, that being said, there are some people we just don't feel comfortable in uh, letting out of custody. And so sometimes we do say no, uh, but we're we're making these decisions, understanding the implications of the pandemic that we are dealing with and doing the best we can in order to address those release decisions. All right. Well, thank you for taking the time with us today. And um, maybe we'll check back with you uh, as things progress, if, uh, you know, it's extended and, and check how you're doing. So. Well, thank you, Robert. Yeah, I, you know, let me just finish by saying Obviously, this has caused problems for all of us. Being at home is a significant problem for us, uh, although it also presents opportunities. And, you know, at a personal level, it gives us time to do a little reflection and sort of reset our lives. But as an institution, we're going to try to, or we are viewing this the same way uh, in the judicial system. We're taking this as an opportunity to reflect on what we are doing and can we make changes in the long run to the way we do things? And this harkens back to one of the questions you asked earlier. And I do think it presents wonderful opportunities. And we will see now in the short run, where I used to think it was more longer term, uh, greater use of technology, uh, allowing witnesses who have to travel from uh, far distances to testify via uh, Zoom or some other video medium, uh, and perhaps just holding hearings where uh, defendants or parties don't necessarily have to come to court. Uh, we can consider ways of doing this. And by the way, uh, my personal guess is this isn't the last type of this situation we've seen. This world is becoming way more connected and will continue to do so. And I don't think this is the last time we're gonna come across a disease that we don't have an initial response for, and we may have to implement this approach again. So now we have some experience and we can you know, perhaps do so less awkwardly than we have this time. All right. Well, thanks for your time, Judge Buckley. Thanks, Robert. Good seeing you again. For more information about Thurston County District Court, go to their website at co.thurston.wa.us slash D-I-S-T-C-R-T. That's all we have for you today. Tune in next time for more updates. Again, 
If you have any questions or suggestions for something we should cover, send an email to rkam at tcmedia.org. Stay home, stay updated with Thurston Community Media, and stay safe, Thurston County.